Let me hi Professor Jan, uh, Professor Ian Mostowski, uh, who will tell us about on the classical limit of quantum mechanics, case study of Rydberg atoms. Please. student, I attended the seminar, and at uh, this seminar, Polish professor said such a sentence. The harmonic oscillator is the beginning and end of the whole physics. <laughs> well, maybe he get exaggerated a little bit, but there is something in it. Now, I will talk about hydrogen atom, which is probably the second most important problem in modern physics, or at least in quantum mechanics. Before I start, let me say a few words about my student time. I took a course from Professor Wielewinski Biula in quantum mechanics. A couple of years later, together with Marek Cieplak and Jerzy Kaminski, they published a textbook on quantum mechanics based on this course. The course was, you should say, difficult. How to measure whether the course was easy or difficult by the percentage of students who failed. The more students, the larger number of failures, the more difficult the course. In this case, the course was really very, very difficult, and I was very proud that I passed it with a good mark. Well, one of the topics discussed, as usual, in, in courses of quantum mechanics was hydrogen atom. Let me start with classical Kepler problem. Kepler problem is, you know, is a particle in the Coulomb field. The Coulomb field, and the, there are solutions. Well, we will discuss only solutions for negative energy. So they are periodic in time. The motion is in a plane. We call it Z equal to zero plane. The motion is periodic. So there one can find Fourier decomposition of this motion. There are Fourier, Fourier components of Fourier coefficients of the motion. You may find them here and there. OK, that's more or less simple. If we go to quantum mechanics, we have Schrodinger equation written upstairs, and there is a solution to this equation for negative energy. At the course I just mentioned, Professor Gavinitsky said, there is a tradition in teaching quantum mechanics to spend two, three, or more hours just solving this equation. But he will not follow, that's what he said, this tradition as if he will just write down the solution. And roughly speaking, that's what he wrote down. Well, that's a monster, isn't it? This formula is really a monster, even if you take into account that this crazy function is a polynomial in fact. But that's rather difficult. The thing I asked myself sometime later, but not very much, was what, what uh, is there any relation between these monster quantum states and classical orbit? We even discussed it a long time ago with Professor Well, it was not very easy, not very difficult to find quantum analogies of circular motion. Namely, I should take states with magnetic quantum number equal to orbital quantum number. This 
localizes the motion in the plane z equal to zero. Especially if you go to large angular momenta, the, this wave function from the previous slide is localized around z equal to zero. Then if you take a state with orbital quantum number equal to principal quantum number minus one, one gets localization in the xy plane for radius equal to n squared. So this is a this is circular motion. Of course, I concentrate for, on the case of large quantum number because otherwise it is completely different stuff. So this was relatively easy, but the question is where are elliptic orbits hidden in these monster functions, hypergeometric functions? And this was my, I guess, my first discovery in physics that what should one do is to take unitary a unitary operation acting on the circular motion. This unitary operation is generated by y by the by a y by the lens back. In classical physics, an analog of the, such a unitary operation is a canonical transformation, obviously, and one can relatively easily check that the canonical transformation generated by the lens vector transforms, as usual, canonical transformation to one solution of Newton's equation into another solution from circular solution to elliptic solution. Well, here if one, after this transformation, the wave function changes from this circular state into an elliptic state. Well, it took many years, something like 10 years, before people started to plot such functions. I took, I copied here a, look here is a word in Polish, I don't know what it is up here, but anyhow, I copied this plot from a physical review of papers by some of the people whom you probably know, they cooperate with, with Kubaza Krzeski and maybe with some other guys. The funny story about it, about this paper, is that about a year earlier, a very similar plot and roughly the same uh, argumentation was published in, in American Journal of Physics. So, rare occasion that in American Journal of Physics, the result in some sense appears before it appears in physical review. Well, So, in this state, one can localize, here is the center, okay. we have an elliptic orbit. Well, what I am going to talk about now is whether one can localize the, princi the principle of localization of electron on this el one electron on this elliptic orbit whether it is possible and how is it possible to localize electron on this orbit. Well, let me recall a much simpler system related probably to this harmonic oscillator beginning and end of the physics, a sodium molecule. This sodium molecule can be, in the ground state, can be excited to a state which is called blah, 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 very difficult names of these states. And here are some basic principles, but I will show them on the plot. If the molecule is in its electronically ground state, it oscillates in such a potential. If the molecule is excited to electronically, one of these excited states, this A, C, or something, okay, it oscillates in this potential. It can oscillate. Imagine a very short pulse excitation from the ground state, which is somewhere here, electronically ground state and vibrationally ground state. It is excited 
to one of the to, 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 wave, to a wave pack in the upper state. This is because uh, light cannot move the wave packet to the left nor to the right. This is from quantum principle, so it ends up here. And when it ends up here, the wave packet oscillates back and forth in this upper potential. And from time to time emits a photon to the ground state. And if it emits a photon while it is here, you will get such a frequency. And if it happens to emit light from this uh, point of this region, the frequency will be larger. So if one looks at the measured spectrum, time-dependent spectrum, you see that after one excitation, uh, just after the excitation, the spectrum is like that. Then the particle moves to the left, and the emitted spectrum is at different frequencies. So by measuring uh, time-dependent spectrum, spectrum of emitted light, one can detect, follow the, uh, the motion of the wave. Now, can we repeat such a thing for uh, Rydberg atoms, for hybrid? Well, here I will use a different idea how to measure by, namely, I would like to study light emitted by a wave packet of, by this electron in the Rydberg state. Well, obviously, you know that that spectrum consists of this discrete line, this Balmer. Yeah, it's called Balmer spectrum. Anyhow, but here I will look at the electric field emitted by electron in the time domain of the party. The radiated part of the field in quantum physics is exactly the same as in classical physics. That's also one of the things I learned from Gary, because so Gary needs to be ruled up because he repeats it over and over again in many places. So the electric field is proportional to the acceleration. So in order to find emitted, the emitted field, its, its intensity, its uh, second order correlation, and so on, one needs to find correlation functions of the uh, acceleration. These acceleration, these matrix elements in various states are given implicitly in the textbook by Landau and Lifshitz with a quotation. A formula for these integrals can be found, but it is too difficult to reproduce it here. Well, in fact, it is difficult but it can be expressed in terms of hypergeometric functions. And I must say that I spent quite a lot of time analyzing this result. I don't wish anybody such calculations, but they are, if somebody likes special functions, this is really very nice. Now, what is the classical limit for large quantum numbers? One can take asymptotic form, but one can do it in various ways. One way is to take the principal quantum number to be very large when the L <coughs> orbital quantum number is a constant. This leads to a, something like classical straight line orbit. You can take the inverse limit. L uh, angular quantum number is, goes to infinity. In, becomes very large, keeping this n minus l, so to say, constant. This leads to circular orbits. And finally, there is a limit, which is the only problem. Mm -hmm. The reasonable limit is to take n principal quantum number going to and l going to infinity in such a way that their ratio is a constant. So there are various limits, and I guess that our friend Push, Marek Push, knows that there are other systems with different uh, classical limit, so to say, and in this case, this order you take the limits 
it does not commute. If you take first the limit of n going to infinity and L equal to constant, you cannot recover this thing. So in this approximation, when you take a principal number to, go to, to be very large, and L, the orbital quantum number, to be very large, but the ratio is a constant, one, can, one gets for the, expect, for the transition matrix element of acceleration, one gets nothing else but Fourier coefficients of the corresponding classical trajectory. Fourier coefficient of the corresponding classical theory. The value of the energy is, comes from the principal quantum number, which is large, okay, but it gives the energy, classical energy, the uh, angular momentum. Uh, so the difference that when you take transition matrix elements between two states, there are two principal quantum numbers, so their difference gives the Fourier coefficient. Well, and the eccentricity is given by the ratio of L the orbital to principal quantum number as shown here. So, once we have correlation functions for the quantum, for the Trans once we have transition matrix elements expressed in a relatively simple form, we can recover classical trajectory corresponding to that, and we can find radiation by taking second order, by taking square of the electric field, fourth power of electric field. This is of course all valid for short time because then we do not. Here is the first correlation function. So this means that the intensity looks like that, that it goes uh, well, okay, that's the Fourier transformation of the spectrum. You see that we have uh, discrete lines, but the motion is periodic, and if you take the Fourier decomposition, you will find all, all these lines known from the Balmer, approximate Balmer point. Approximate, because we are doing approximate. The classical approximation. The average intensity of radiation is proportional to the correlation function for T, and does not depend upon time. So if you have an electron orbit in a given state, given energy state, the emitted radiation does not depend on time, because we may like them to remember for that for short times, in the Fourier spectrum becomes. The spectrum can be approximated from the classical order. More interesting is the second order correlation function with two time, two time correlation function. This was calculated using this classical approximation for the matrix element. And what one gets is something like that, the second order correlation function. So if the intensity is large at some moment, this means that the electron is close to the nucleus at this moment, because then the acceleration is large and the radiation is the strongest, then if the electron goes away, it moves to the smaller acceleration and after one period, it goes, the intensity of radiation is large, and so on, and so on. In this way, by measuring the correlation between functions, one can, as we see in principle, gain information from the position of the electron in the highly excited river state. Well, this is the Summary, the average intensity is constant. The first order correlation gives the spectrum by lines separated by frequency of the motion. And second order correlation gives information about the position of the electron on this particle. 
Thank you very much. I dedicate this talk to Professor Zola, who guided me through quantum physics for many years. Thank you. We have definitely time to some questions, please. Thank you for a very nice talk. I picked up that Landau Lifshitz uses the expression of acceleration for stationary states. What it was it? Uh, mm -hmm. I misunderstood you. Yes, it's not only Landau Lifshitz. There's no acceleration in stationary states. Well, there is no acceleration on average. But if you take the square of acceleration and correlation, one point, another point, here it is. The average, you are absolutely right. I have to learn more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question, please. In, in this context of classical versus quantum in these states, uh, I learned one thing that I was surprised. One, many years ago, there was these longer transformations where you learn that when you have quantum mechanics, you always learn in three dimension, angular momentum is L times L plus one. When you do WQB, then Kramer's pointed out, you shouldn't take L times L plus one. You should rather take L plus a half squared. Yes. Okay? Now that's called a longer transformation, the longer uh, your transformation. And I, I, I struggled for a long time trying to understand why it is that. And many people have written about it, and we noticed the following thing, and that's why it's related to your talk. You might not see no, the relation, okay, but it's coming in a second. Uh, you talked about the motion being in a plane. Now, the reason you get into trouble with WKB is because you're doing it in the radial motion, and WKB is not valid. If you would take a wave function, and take an area density and write that down and do WKB. Then you get automatically L plus a half squared. And WKB works. And why is that? Because classically, the motion is two-dimensional. And it's an area that counts and not a linear motion. And that's why, you see, you talked about the elliptical orbits and all this. It's a two-dimensional motion. And not, one, and not a one-dimensional motion. That's where the longer transformation comes in, where the classical physics, so to speak, enters. Look, thank you very much for this remark. I would like to point out such a thing. I never used WKD approximation. No, you didn't. Nothing about yeah. that. The elliptic wave function that I showed is only shown in, in a plane that's a cut, so yeah. to say. If you look into this paper, you will see cuts into other yeah. planes. Yeah. So there's a truly three-dimensional motion. In a, okay. So I am free to use any appro reasonable approximation I want. Okay. L plus one from over n for me is the same as L, L over n. L plus one half over n is yeah. the same yeah. exactly. So I are in the limit. Well, that's an asymptote because this yeah. n squared would give the scale of energy. I have to keep it constant, yeah. large but but not infinity. Otherwise, it would be. Okay. Uh, just a short uh, question. You mentioned this uh, dumping, which is uh, neglected, but uh, uh, clearly this dumping acts in the lifetime of the excited state, right? Yes, you are so very right. So this is basically a short time approximation. The amount of energy, but classically speaking, the amount of energy emitted during one or two periods is negative. Okay? I have to wait and wait and wait to see that the, 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 the sum energy has been accumulated. Okay? So this is completely different from the picture, this purely quantum picture that you see jumped. The electron sits in a state, sits, 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 it is a little bit lower, okay? I am interested in this period between these, so to say, jumps, okay? Time dependent things. The density is small, as opposed to this molecular case where we observe a spontaneous transition in the optical range where the intensity, the photon energy is large and it is relatively easy to detect it. In this case of 
the Rindberg states I talked about, well, the energy emitted is small and it is in the range of microwaves, so it is not that easy. Okay, but in principle. Any more questions or comments? If not, ah, okay, there's one more question, please. Uh, I don't have a question about this uh, chemical substance uh, with, nat uh, with uh, natrium or sodium. 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 Uh, if there was an experimental testing of similar uh, ideas in semiconductor case, with, uh, because uh, I suspect that there were many direction on quantum level, on very low level of, there is lot of space at the bottom according to, <laughs> So, with, uh, with silicon or other substances, because there is a lot of experimental physics done for semiconductors on the quantum level and below or around. So, have you, have you some colleagues or works to know about who deal with this, uh, this technological problem, experimental problems? So, this is not well, I don't know. Okay, but okay. there is uh, some mm -hmm. correlation between. This, this story downwards, so not, not from the solar system, but it's keep, the, keeping themselves in the level of um, small quantum level, but having some analogies with what we know about solar system or plasma mechanics to a degree. Let's see, other part. The, 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 the motivation for regression is uh, evacuation of heat in the uh, density of electronic devices, we have the problem how to evacuate this heat. So this is heat produced over there. Is there any hint of such stories in your research or after? This is my question. Well, so answers. the short and simple answer is I don't know, I don't see any, but okay, I, I, I may have a look. Well, there are some similarities, of course, in solid state. For instance, there are excitons, okay, which resemble hydrogen atom, there are quantum dots where one can see something like molecules, or, but I don't know much about these experiments to compare them with. Because they, they use light also? Use light. Yes, I know. <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? If not, let's find the speaker again.